Okay. Okay. It doesn't like it. Okay. We're going to have the head. Do you have audio? Oh, maybe not. There you go. Perfect. Okay. Go ahead. Um, someone's leaving, clearly, because I've started talking. Um, I don't know. Okay. Hi. Uh, can can they hear me? Can you hear me? I assume you can hear me. Hi, um, I'm Maria. I'm a third and hopefully final PhD year PhD student at Loughborough. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the possible links between hearing loss and dementia. Um, and then talk a little bit about a few of my studies from my PhD. So <laughs> first thing I was going to say was um, that hearing loss is a global growing global concern, but Dali has kind of already talked to you a little bit about that. Um, but what I will add is that younger adults are at a greater risk um, of developing hearing loss um, due to noise exposure and um, lifestyle behaviours like attending concerts and, and things like that. Um, and there's been this kind of growing interest in the relationship between um, hearing loss and cognitive decline and dementia. Um, and a number of systematic reviews have recently found that hearing loss increases the risk of uh, mild cognitive impairment, Alzheimer's disease and dementia. Um, it's been quite well established that there does seem to be some kind of association. Um, and a recent Lancet review that came out in 2020 on the modifiable um, factors, um, dementia prevention and modifiable risk factors um, for dementia found that hearing loss was the greatest modifiable risk factor um, for dementia. So there's clearly a relationship here, but we're not really sure why. Um, so I'm gonna just very kind of quickly outline three possible explanations for this association. So the first one is the common cause pathway. And this suggests that there's not actually a causal relationship between hearing loss and dementia, but they're both um, expressions of widespread neurodegeneration and that microvascular damage in the cochlea, so in the ear, um, could just be an early expression of uh, a more widespread vascular um, disease. And support for this comes from evidence that both hearing loss and dementia um, have a number of common risk factors such as cardiovascular disease, diabetes, hypertension, physical inactivity, and smoking. So based on this model, um, dementia risk might be modifiable for adults with um, hearing loss through lifestyle behaviors, such as increasing physical activity and smoking cessation. Alternatively, um, another model is the cognitive reserve or load hypothesis. So this is based on the assumption that we have a finite number of cognitive resources and things like early life education, which probably links back very well to Dahlia's talk, um, increases the number of cognitive resources that we have available. Whereas hearing loss acts as an additional cognitive load. Um, which can decrease the number. So one way that this might work, if you can see the diagram, is that someone with normal hearing may be able to equally divide their cognitive resources between processing auditory information and carrying out other um, tasks or activities or other cognitive processes. Someone with hearing loss um, may need to divert more of these cognitive resources towards processing auditory information, leaving fewer available for uh, other activities and tests and, and cognitive processes. Um, and this may, uh, there's a possibility this may have downstream effects on uh, neural function and structure, um, which could has been suggested to lead to potentially um, permanent changes in neuroplasticity um, and an acceleration of neurodegeneration, which increases the likelihood of dementia. So if we take this model, um, we could potentially modify dementia risk um, through hearing aid provision and use, because not necessarily the same thing. Um, having a hearing aid doesn't necessarily mean that you use it. Um, so, and the way that this would work was that if the, someone was wearing their hearing aid, they should hopefully um, be uh, not need to use as much uh, many cognitive resources to, to process information and would leave uh, more, more available for, for other activities and um, processes. And the third one 
I'm going to talk about is the psychosocial cascade. So this is based on the idea that the communication difficulties that arise as a uh, due to hearing loss um, often mean that people uh, withdraw from or avoid social interactions and social activities, which puts them at greater risk of social isolation and loneliness. This in turn increases the risk of, of depression. Um, and depression in itself um, has been found to be more prevalent in people with hearing loss. And on top of that, social isolation and depression are in themselves uh, risk factors for dementia in later life. So it's all, a bit, it's all a bit complicated, but really what this model suggests is that hearing loss sets off this cascade of negative psychosocial events that kind of build on each other and add on each other and increase this risk of dementia. I hope I've explained that okay. Um, so based on this model, we might say that we could reduce dementia risk um, in people with hearing loss through psychosocial interventions, which might be improving social engagement uh, and, and social well, uh, psychological well-being. In reality, it's probably a bit of a mixture of all these different uh, models that all contribute to the increased risk of dementia. Um, and I will note as well that I have just given three very simple models. They tend to be a lot more detailed. There are other models, uh, there are sub models of these, um, but I just wanted to give a very brief kind of overview of three of the most common. Untangling these underlying mechanisms are kind of beyond my PhD and my own capabilities, but it's really important to understand the conceptual associations um, so that we can see how and where we might be able to intervene to reduce the risk of dementia in this, in this population. And one thing we are particularly interested in is physical inactivity. Um, so recent studies have started looking at this and um, one that came out last year found that older adults um, with hearing loss engage in around 30 minutes less physical activity each day than those um, the normal hearing counterparts. Um, and this accelerates aging, um, and I'm sure all of you know that physical inactivity is also a risk factor for dementia. Um, it's a risk factor for cardiovascular disease and diabetes, and all these things seem to be interacting with hearing loss. Um, one of the caveats of kind of the research that I've talked about so far is that it's all been done in older adults. So one of the things that I've done as part of my PhD um, is look at hearing across adulthood, so from 18 to 87. Um, I'm going to talk very quickly over the next few slides about three of my studies, um, but these are very brief overviews, so if you are interested, I'm happy to talk in more detail at a later date. Um, so, all right. okay, so the first uh, study we looked at was um, we did an online um, survey where we looked at almost 500 people um, across the adult lifespan with and without hearing loss. Um, and this was part of a study that looked at a whole range of things with different validated self-report measures. So we looked at hearing, cognition, uh, demographics, uh, lifestyle behaviours, cardiovascular health, all sorts of things. And um, we found that basically age was associated with everything. Um, so because of that, we um, did a, a median split. So we split the sample. So we have a younger and older group. And what we found was, what you're seeing, sorry, are the final logistic regression models. We found that in the younger age group, there was pretty strong relationship between uh, self-reported hearing difficulties and memory problems, where people with hearing difficulties were more likely to report memory problems, and it was almost four times as likely. But there was no association between hearing difficulties um, and sport participation or memory problems and sport participation. An older age group, which was quite interesting, um, the association between hearing difficulties and memory problems was much weaker. Um, and in fact, in the final regression model, it wasn't actually significant. It was just a trend where people who reported memory problems were more likely to report hearing difficulties. What, what we did find was that um, people that reported hearing difficulties were less likely to be engaged in sport participation, um, but people that 
were engaged in sport were less likely to report memory problems. So there's kind of a little bit of support there for this, this kind of hearing, physical activity, cognition relationship, but the main drawback of the study is that everything was self-reported, um, which kind of limits the confidence we can have in the associations. So we carried out another study where we measured some of these um, variables using behavioral measures. So firstly, we measured hearing using the Hear Who app, which Ahmed kindly gave a little shout out to earlier. So this is from the, from the World Health Organization and it's a validated digit and noise test. I've also put the QR code for it on there. If you would like to test it yourself, it's available on um, iOS and Android. Um, it only takes about four minutes. But basically at the end of it, you get a score out of 100. Um, and a score of below 50 would indicate that there's uh, some degree of hearing loss. So that's what we class people as having a hearing loss. Again, we looked at the different age groups and what you're seeing are analysis of covariance where we controlled for education and gender. In the younger age group, we found that um, those that failed the hearing test or hearing screener um, performed more poorly on a test of global cognition um, and also reported greater experiences of loneliness. Whereas the older adults also performed more poorly on the global cognition test, but um, were, uh, were less physically active. Um, so global cognition, we had three measures of cognition, sorry, we had global cognition, uh, verbal fluency and verbal learning. And the only one that was significant was global cognition. Um, and to assess physical activity, this was done by an interview and we used the International Physical Activity Questionnaire. I meant to say that before, sorry. So collectively, these two studies kind of show that there are associations between hearing difficulties and other health conditions, but that these differ across, differ across adulthood and may require different interventions at different stages of life. And so for younger adults, we could suggest that interventions maybe focus on psychosocial well-being and hearing aid provision, because we also found that the younger adults were less likely to own or use hearing aids. Um, and for older adults, then maybe we should be looking at increasing physical activity, as this would also potentially mitigate the risk of other cardiovascular diseases and diabetes. So there's kind of been this increasing interest in physical activity and hearing loss and the previous two studies sort of show a bit of support for this too but we don't really know why hearing loss is related to physical inactivity so um carried out a small qualitative study with um 10 of the previous participants so all the participants in in my research um took part in the first study and then some took part in the second and then i had 10 that took part in, in this study, very kindly gave me my time. Um, so this was um, developed using the theoretical domains framework and the combi model of behavior. These are super uh, health behavior theories from health psychology, um, which were developed as a way of systematically um, assessing and designing behavior interventions. So rather than uh, people cherry picking their favorite kind of health behavior change model or the favorite sort of way. These provide a, a guide that allow you to develop your interventions um, based on theory and, and evidence-driven um, research. So we conducted these uh, this, uh, interviews looking at the barriers and facilitators to physical activity. Um, and the way that we did this, I'll just give you a quick example. So. Um, the transcripts were first inductively, inductively coded. <laughs> Dave is nodding, yeah, inductive. Um, so for example, uh, one of our the themes, we sub-themes that we developed was mental fatigue arising as a consequence of hearing difficulties. This is then linked to the theoretical domains framework, um, which was memory, attention, and decision processes. And then, then this is then linked to the combi model of behavior where this um, comes under psychological capability. Um, and the combi model kind of uh, poses that you need capability, motivation, and opportunity in order to enact a specific behavior, and that these should be the targets for behavioral interventions. Um, 
So what was really interesting about this study was, I've just given three examples of the sub themes that we came up with. So we've got hearing loss related stigma and physical activity that exacerbates communication difficulties, um, particularly when physical activity often uh, is, occurs in acoustically challenging environments such as sports halls and big open fields. Um, so we found there were both general and hearing specific barriers to, and facilitators, which suggest that um, people with hearing loss do need additional support to be engaged in physical activity. The really, really interesting thing was that hearing aids didn't overcome these barriers. Nine out of 10 of the participants were regular hearing aid users and a number of them, well, I think almost all of them um, didn't like wearing their hearing aids whilst being active. Uh, for a number of reasons, they would get sweaty, they would feel uncomfortable, they were worried about breaking them, um, they're worried about uh, ear infections because they didn't feel sanitary. So kind of really interesting to see that what would normally be the uh, key um, uh, management tool, which is hearing aid provision, actually doesn't help with this situation um, and therefore we would suggest that we maybe need physical and activity interventions that address these specific barriers and go beyond hearing aid provision um, to improve physical activity in people with hearing loss. So I'm kind of, I'm done. Um, the hearing loss is a modifiable risk factor for, for dementia and the key word is it's modifiable. The associations between hearing and other health conditions do differ across the lifespan and hearing aids do not wholly solve the barriers um, that people with hearing loss face. Um, and we are suggesting that behavioural interventions pose a potential avenue to support lifestyle changes in adults with hearing loss to reduce the risk of additional non-communicable diseases. Um, and my favourite quote from um, the Livingston paper is, be ambitious about prevention. Thank you. Um, next to my supervisors, Ethan David. Um, I would like to point out David is not the pigeon or a seagull sorry but he did request that the seagull be in the picture brilliant thank you so much maria do we have before you go uh, do we have questions in the room or online for maria Uh, no, please don't. <laughs> David has a question. I just wanted to ask, uh, no. so you showed that there was potentially no association in younger adults with physical activity or sport participation, which is our proxy measure, mm -hmm. but then there was this association in older adults. So I just wondered at what point in the lifespan does that kind of, do you speculate that that happens and when should we be intervening with these physical activity interventions? I think, I'm not sure because I think one of the things we have to be aware of is that the people reporting hearing difficulties in the younger age group um, are possibly reporting different types of hearing loss. Um, that, so the older age group is what, um, what's it, what do I call it, Dahlia? Lifestyle related hearing loss now? Lifestyle related hearing loss, whereas the younger adults might be exhibiting different. Um, so if they've had it from a younger age, um, they might have been more used to being physically active. I'm going to go, I'm kind of looking at one of my participants here, guidance. <laughs> um, yeah, um, but also I think the other thing to be very aware of is that uh, we know that younger adults um, overreport their hearing difficulties. So that might also be a factor in there. So, which may explain why there was no association found. Yeah. I don't know. I just want to give him that Joel Livingston's paper shows that Prevention it's midlife, midlife yeah. Might be beneficial. Perhaps that when adults begin to stop being their I think so, possibly. I think from the conversations I had with the participants in the behavioural study, um, they were kind of not actually part of the quality study, but kind of off the book, was where they were sort of saying that they, when they started families, they became less physically active. I know you're nodding to this, David, because big family um but when they retired they found more time and that was always one of the big barriers to being active is is, is time and money um so yeah so maybe that's why but i also think that the cardiovascular health issues all come about around the same time as well so i think there's some major interactions going on there and just one comment and it's the same that i really made to Dalla, is that maybe eight percent is modifiable 
you know, terrorism yeah. is the largest modifiable risk factor for dementia in midlife, but it's only 8%. So what about that other 96%? So, um, so this is actually something that came up, I think, recently, possibly in the Interdem task force, maybe? can't remember um where i think one of the things they're kind of discussing is what the it, the interactions with various different modifiable risk factors and how they maybe don't just add but it might be a bit more than that um so i think that's something that would be interesting to look at later yeah can i add something uh, maria on top of what you've said yeah can you hear me yeah, uh, it's just something that uh, came up now during uh, your talk and uh, following the discussion. I think that uh, worth exploring whether perceptions of uh, aging after the onset of hearing loss possibly uh, modify the participation in uh, uh, physical activities. So I think the data set in ELSA gives us the opportunity to do that. So could potentially design a study and see I think I think absolutely because one of the things I didn't present because there was a lot of things that came up in that qualitative study was that one of the main sort of facilitators was people's sort of self-efficacy with disclosing hearing loss um, and how confident they felt in telling people that they had a hearing loss and whether and what they needed um, and that was kind of the main facilitator really to being physically active and I think you're absolutely spot on the perception of aging and like a, the, the hearing loss stigma is probably really key in, in that aspect. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, well done. Very good work. Thank you. Well done to your supervisors as well. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Maria. Okay, well, look, thank you so much to 